like I like the definition given by someone. SRE is like when you put software engineers in charge of operations. So that was that's what SRE looks like. Go back, please. Let's previous slide. So um, our key roles look like developing and maintaining scalable systems. They are really large systems. Um, monitoring their performance, how these um, systems perform over time, and also responding to incidents. Like things happen every day. I'm sure that maybe you have tried using UBA, and UBA app is not opening. It's giving one very stupid error. Yeah, so an incident is happening behind the scene, and we as a service try to resolve those incidents. So when those incidents happen, um, of course, what caused that incident? We try to get to the root cause. We do things like post-mortem, right? Oh, what happened? How do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And a whole lot of all that. So we also do automation, like just DevOps, when you automate a lot of things, because you know when things are automated, like um, that reduces a lot of human errors. For example, the GitLab guy that deleted their database was 300 gig. Um, so we also look at enhancing system security and data protection, like a lot of transmission of data has to run through TLS and the rest of all that. Next. All right, so uh, now we'll be talking about the importance of system reliability. Uh, system reliability is critical to when systems fail and the impacts could be, can be profound. Well, some of the real world impacts of uh, system failures are financial loss, uh, interruptions can result in loss in sales and extra costs to resolve the issues. Like when, uh, like when UBA fails me multiple times, I'm eventually going to take my money away from them and move to another bank. So financial loss, reputation damage, me not trusting any bank or a specific bank in this case. So system failures can cause reputation damage. Loss of produ productivity. Well, I'm sure we've all experienced when maybe GitHub is down and then we all thank God because we don't have to, we have nowhere to push our code, so we just take the day off. So productivity loss is another, is another impact of system failures. And data loss. So, well, like Greg, Greg just mentioned, the engineer that deleted uh, <laughs> database at GitLab. Well, thankfully they were able to recover, but in severe cases, you may or may not be able to recover your data, and so data loss is, like, is, a, is an important reason why we try to make systems reliable. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So um, what does a system failure look like? Um, so a system failure looks like when a system or maybe a component is not performing as it's intended to. For example, I don't know why I like using UB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the UB bank app, <laughs> you are trying to log in. Mm, it's showing you black screen. So the login feature is not working. <laughs> That, 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 that is what it looks like. And um, sometimes it could be a complete shutdown. We have seen where MTN goes blank. <laughs> or yes, during 2021, Facebook went and all their services yeah. went down. Like, we are blank. A lot of businesses were affected. And we can also have cases of performance degradation. You see, we are things become very slow. Very slow, no response. And sometimes they might even time out. And um, security breach, hmm. Um, passwords, user email addresses, names, and the rest are published, and also data corruption. We have had cases where things happen, data is corrupted, and they are no longer usable. So these are what um, um, system yeah, failures look like. And it could be from the minor inconvenience of like trying to log in into your UBA app, or to be the disruption of business completely. For example, Facebook. Next case. So um, what we are going to try to do now is give you case studies. Like, I've been part of so many incidents at work. Like, I wake up every day and solve problems. That's, my, that's what happens now. So we'll try to give you case studies of what you have experienced and discuss them. So let's take case study one, high database CPU usage incident. So we observe one day that, wow, anytime a reporting button was initiated, everything becomes slow. You see customers start complaining at the rest. So we try to look into it, and we see that for over two hours, the database is spiking whenever we try to use the reporting function. And 
what is the cause of that? So the system was a reporting system built on Ruby. Um, the failure, anytime that um, reporting function is initiated, this database CPU skyrockets, and is slowing down not just the reporting, but also slowing down other applications that use that database. And so the impact was this report generation slow, everything slow, everything going bad. So next slide. So analysis of case study one. Can anyone look at this code and tell me what's wrong with this? This Ruby. Mm, okay. Anyone? Look at the code and tell me what's wrong with this. Okay. Um, let's not take time. So first, user.all. We are loading. Okay, sure. M plus one problem. So for every post is doing a query. For every user, it first loads all the users into the database. So imagine we have five million users. Five million users has been loaded into the database memory. Okay. Now, for each user, is iterating over every post and it's also doing some magic. You see, this, this, this is really bad. This is really bad code. I even wonder, and I was responsible for this. <laughs> yeah. But this is not exactly the code. I just made it look this way. So yeah, of course. So, but this is what was happening. This is really bad. Next slide. So this code was inefficient. First of all, users are all loaded. All users are loaded into memory, and also, at it's making a setup um, um, second database query for each user post. M plus one problem. If you know about big O notations, yeah, you know the M plus one problem. Um, so response, hmm. we did that the code, and I was the one that committed it. Just imagine, bad day at office, um, and it was refactored, and I was told never to write Ruby at that time again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they told me to stick to what I know best, Roland. Um, the refactored code, I, uh, the, I do. This doesn't have to do with language specific, but yeah. Um, what worked, the refactored code significantly reduced database CPU usage. And we shifted. Another thing was that we should not even do reporting in the main database. We have a read replica. Why not put it in the read replica? Because the reporting function doesn't write anything to the database, right? Just use the read replica and like save it from uh, hampering other business um, applications. So we shifted to the read replicas. And what didn't work? Our initial sys alerting system didn't catch the issue until we are impacted. Next slide. So lessons that we learned, always be mindful of potential impacts of database. Always monitor, like granular monitoring. I didn't want monitoring for long um, running queries on AWS. We would have fished this as and been alerted when um, this query has been running. Oh, you have a query running for more than one hour. What is going on? Yeah. So. Also, code reviews. Like, I, everyone at the company still wonder how that code went in production. Um, but yeah, regular code reviews um, will catch things like this. Next slide. Reveal. All right, so I'm going to run through this one really quickly because we're out of time. But the second case study is uh, actually taking the database offline because why not? Uh, the, the primary database was running on Azure and was handling most of the customer transactions. Uh, the failure was. Uh, CPU usage on the database spiked to 100%, and the impact was like the database was down for the well, for half a day. Next slide, please. Yeah, so like I said, uh, hopping on Azure Monitor, I, on the Azure portal, I figured out that uh, CPU usage was 100%, but this wasn't entirely my fault as Azure was deprecating a single server, the single server instance at that time, and performance was like severely impacted. So the response was to move over to a new database instance type, and that like brought the server back, on the database back online. So like I said, that was what worked, and what didn't was our monitoring systems didn't alert us because there was no monitoring. <laughs> yeah. So the ba the real lesson here is please monitor your systems. Uh, deprecation warnings. You should probably not, um, look out for deprecations on cloud providers. 
in this case, Azure wasn't sending us any, so that's why uh, the incident occurred. So please, could you like skip slides? Yeah, uh, sorry. You might have seen this tweet at some point, but this was another incident that happened, and yeah, the story was supposed to be here, so we can skip. Okay. Um, yeah. There was another interesting case study, but it seems like we are out of time. Um, but it's hampering our talk. Okay. Yeah. So how, m how many minutes do I have left? Like I think we're out of time. <laughs> Just five. Okay. Yes. I think we can cover it quickly. Huh? Oh. Um. Yes. We have a Q and A. So, but just go back. I can do this quickly. Um. Back. 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 So high CPU data. Um. Still times. So we discovered that um, RTT means round trip time. Yeah, so we have a higher, something that takes um, one minute, it's not taking more than 30 minutes, and it's timing out. So that is what RTT means, round trip time. And that it was affecting our message broker, RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ was affected, severely degraded, leading to slow message processing and um, communication between the services. You know when your services depend on RabbitMQ, and everything is slowed down, you know what that impacts. Next. I'm trying to rush this next, please. Okay, so the root cause was that um, a simple state time is when, okay, in the virtualized environment, right, we have VMs. Of course, you know AWS is, is virtualized. So we have VMs, right, and there's a physical CPU. The physical CPU was busy servicing our neighbors, but starving us, starving our rabbit MQ. So, that was what is a CPU time, uh, speed time. You can just check that out maybe later. So it was busy servicing others, but starving us. Um, the response was that, you know, when everything, you have more than 3 million messages on RabbitMQ, you don't want to produce more messages. So there's something called back pressure. We're trying to back pressure, like try to um, reduce these messages that are being created, and also we have to reboot. It's a cluster system. So you, in a cluster system, you don't reboot. Um, Immediate, like all immediately, you have to reboot in a staggered manner one by one. And also, we explored to resolve this, we explored cross AZ configurations and resize our VMs to bigger ones. What worked? This helped us to an extent, but did not resolve the issue completely. And what didn't initial attempts to re um, resolve this yeah. were not successful because of the type of instance we are using. Next, so always monitor the right metrics. You can monitor CPU, monitor memory, and the rest of all that. But if you're not monitoring stuff that are um, specific to virtualized systems, then you have issues. Also, we is, uh, optimize our instance. We change to ones that um, are performant for uh, um, things that use Dix, Dix IO. And we also recognize the need maybe we could go to a more scalable infrastructure, like using Kubernetes and the rest of all that. So yeah, that was the lessons learned from case study tray. Um, yeah, so like again, we're out of time, so like we're going yeah. to have to wrap so up here. So next, 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 next. Yeah, we actually don't have any more time. Okay, okay. Um, we're out of time, but I will. I don't know. Maybe you can ask me any questions. Do anyone have a question, please? Yeah. yeah. Wait, sure. So um, monitoring seems to be a common theme with all these problems, yeah. and I. Definitely, you react to it, you set up all these uh, alerts, but what were proactive steps that you took after this incident? Because yeah, you set up an alert for this specific incident. Do you try to look at your system, your infrastructure, and try and identify other actionable items that you should set alerts on to prevent such in the future? Yes. So are you talking for this case study tree? Oh, general. Oh, general. So during post-mortems, we discuss what really happened, yeah? Well, we discuss what happened and try to see solutions that we're going to take. Of course, the issue has been resolved before post but we had to look at the solutions that we took. Are these solutions more scalable long term, right? Are these solutions, um, is this just a quick fix like putting um, a silo tape around something? We look at all these during post analyze this and see how we can um, resolve these issues long term. Because the um, why post are necessary is that so that they don't occur in the future. Do you understand? Yeah. So, um, OK, 
scout us. Um, I want in your in the case study you said your message broker and the application were in the same instance. No, not the same instance. Then how come it was having? Okay, so a message broker. Let me give you an example. A message broker like Rabbit MQ will process messages for you. So for example, now we might have an image processing service, um, right? So when the message broker like Rabbit MQ sent um, sent this message to the um, Instance results service, it does what it's supposed to do. So there are different instance. You know when you have um, different systems, you have to have a way to message in between them. So it's not the same instance. No, no, no. So when some like it's just like um, a deadlock. I need something from you, but I'm not getting it. Then I'm confused on what to do. You understand? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. A round of applause for them. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. So we.